Thank you, Cass. Thank you, youth. Have a great time in your program. Last one for the year, I believe. And uh, who loves this time of year? I love it. First day of summer, you would not know it. And, uh, and my family are apologies today. They are crook, uh, flat as a tack, got a cold, uh, which is not what you want heading into summer. But I love summer. I love the summer of cricket. Who's been loving the cricket? And uh, how's that? David Warner, 335 yesterday. And, uh, and uh, so we're a church for all people, multi-ethnic. And so to my um, Pakistani brothers and sisters, if they're in the house today, look, just condolences. It's going to be a long day for you today. So we're continuing the season who, uh, series, Who Are You Listening To? And uh, I'm, I'm a terrible listener. Is anyone else in that category? You're just, you're just a terrible listener sometimes. And uh, I saw this uh, this week. If we've got that first slide, Declan. And uh, it speaks for itself. <laughs> this can be me sometimes. Sam, what, did you even hear what I said? And I just love that. That's a weird way to start the sentence. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I just kind of, I just kind of zone out, I just zone out. And without even realising it, I'm just, you know, getting distracted by something that's happening over here when the person's talking to me. And I've really got to focus. So, so if you've got ADHD, then I'm right there with you. And uh, you understand what I'm talking about. And so if you're a bad listener, but we are talking in this series about listening. And, uh, and that's what we're digging into today. We're looking at listening and also being led. Listening and being led. But I'm, I'm encouraged by uh, Samuel in the book of Samuel. Aren't you? That, that God had to get his attention three times. Samuel, Samuel, Samuel. And sometimes I feel like that's me, that... I don't always pick up what God's saying to me straight away. And I, I just think there's so many encouraging things like that in the Bible. And Samuel didn't think it was God's voice. He thought it was Eli's voice. And so he had trouble discerning it. And so if, if, you, don't, if you struggle hearing God's voice or if you struggle with listening, be encouraged. Because Samuel was basically a pastor. He was a trainee pastor. And, uh, and we see in 1 Samuel 3 that... He was the most qualified of anyone his age to hear from God because it shows us when God spoke to him, this is where he was. The lamp of God had not yet gone out and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord. So he was actually in the temple. He, he wasn't just going to church like he lived there. He was there all the time. And this is where the ark of God was. So he was around the, the Holy Scriptures. He was in the temple all the time. And and he still needed help hearing God's voice. And so that was encouraging to me that God can get our attention. He knows how to do it. And sometimes he knows that we're a bit hard of listening. Sometimes he knows that we're like me at home sometimes, or probably more so my kids that have selective hearing, that I'll, I'll be like yelling at them and they'll just be glued in to Peppa Pig. And because <laughs> nothing's more exciting than Peppa Pig. And so, and, but then as soon as I say, like, I just test them sometimes, and I'll just say, um, do you want, you know, do you want this? Do you want that? And I'll ask them all these things. I'm like, do you want some chocolate? And it's like, they, they're like, bang. They're like, right with me. And I've heard everything I said right then and there. And sometimes we can be like that with God as well, can't we? That we can have selective hearing. Sometimes we can zone him out. But what I want to say, drawing attention to this, what happened when the Word of God came to Samuel should encourage us that although he didn't hear from him often, we need to pay attention to where he was. He was in the temple, he was in the house of God and he was near the scriptures. And if you're wanting God to speak to you more, if you're wanting to hear his voice more, then we need to get in the house of God. We need to hear the preaching of the word and we need to get in scripture. And I remember, I remember what, do you remember what, um, Pastor Rick Warren said at the start of the year, sometimes we look for God in a vision to do this kind of dramatic thing and just to like a bolt from heaven. We look for him in a vision when God wants to speak to us in a verse. He wants to speak to us in a verse and the best place to hear from God is in the Word of God. And the best way to get it, the best environment, the most conducive environment to hearing from God is also here. In a, in a gathering like this, where you hear preaching, where there's music to open you up, 
and to be in the presence of God. And there's a greater chance of hearing from God if you're in the room and if you're in the Word. Samuel was a, a learner. He had devoted his life to hearing from God, to reading the Scriptures. I wondered today, are you, are you a learner? Are you a student? Are you a trainee of Jesus? And do you want to know more, God more deeply? I wonder if that's you here today. Well, we've been looking at this series about the different voices. I love how Cass started the series about looking at the, just the different voices, the different influences, what we listen to, what we watch, who we hang around. These are all, all such good things. And what I learned is that part of becoming what it is to become mature is to know which voices to tune out, like these ones down the front. Yeah. <laughs> that was perfect timing. We'll know which things to tune out and know the right things to tune into. Isn't that right? Being able to tune into the right things. And, and in terms of, I love that we're looking at temptation as well, the voice of temptation. And, oh, he's like, here we go. You're going to be slam me over the head about temptation. It's like, no, this one, this one is good. You get this. It's like the temptation that comes when you're thinking about exercise and, and you even start exercising and you start running and there's that the voice that just says, stop, <laughs> go home and put your feet up. This is too hard. I know that. Anyone else know that voice? Or the voice, the voice of when, you, when there's um, an important thing you've got to do and there's that voice of like snacking or the voice of ice cream from your freezer late at night when it's like the worst thing, the worst time of the night to eat. But that's like the one time of the night, it's like 10 p.m. when you want to eat ice cream. It's that voice, it's that seductive voice from the freezer just calling, calling your name. So we're looking at some of these different voices or like the voice, she's not here today, but the voice of my wife, like before I get up to preach, she's just like, Sam, just in, in the back of my head, I'm like, don't say anything stupid. But she, she knew what she was getting herself in for. This is an unstoppable force. But isn't it, isn't it amazing the kind, of, the kind of things that pop into your head or the temptations you have when you, when you try and do something good and godly? It's like when you sit down and try and pray, just all the things that just pop into your mind you've got to do. Isn't it, are you with me? Do you know what I'm saying? It's like when you, when you actually, your heart is to um, spend some time in devotion to God and just there's, there's all these things that pop up that would try and distract you from doing what you're doing. All these temptations that we, that we have. And so the, the ultimate temptation, the original temptation we see in, in the Garden of Eden, where, where God has, has set up um, this beautiful place for Adam and Eve to dwell. And he's saying, you can eat of anything. All this is yours. All this is yours. He's given us this abundant, gave them this abundant provision but then he said this in Genesis 2. You are free to eat of any tree in the garden, but the only thing is that you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat, you will certainly die. There was one thing that God said, hey, I'm putting this in place for your protection. I'm putting this one thing. You've got all this provision, but there's only this one protection. That's for your own good. And then the serpent came to tempt and said this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other of the wild animals and the Lord had made. He said to the woman, and this is the way the temptation came. He said, did God really say, this is in verse three, did God really say? So he didn't directly come in and say, do this bad thing, do this thing you shouldn't be doing. But the temptation came in the point of questioning what God had said. Wow, isn't that, isn't that good to be reminded of that often temptation comes to us in that way. And so that we need to know what God has said in order to do the things that God has called us to do and to live the full life that He's called us to, we need to know what the Bible says. Did God really say? And then the woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat of the fruit on the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. Isn't that interesting? You know that God did not say you can't touch it. He said you can't eat it. And so there's a confusion that has come in around what God has said. 
And there's a confusion that have come in that starts to creep in around not just the command of God, but also the character of God. And there's a questioning that starts to take place, a temptation that all of a sudden, hold on, I don't know, really know what the, what the Bible says, but, and I also don't really know that if God's got my best interest at heart. Dallas Willard says this about temptation, that all temptation, we got that, not that one. The basic idea behind, behind all temptation is this. God is presented as depriving us by his commands of what is good so that we must take matters into our, our own hands and to act contrary to what he has said. That this is the way temptation comes, to, to tempt us to take matters into our own hands, to take um, goodness, the goodness of life that God's not going to give it to me so I've got to get it myself, my way which is contrary to his word. And so that's what's happening in the garden. And so we need to know God's commands, but we also need to know his character. That it wasn't that, it wasn't about, the emphasis wasn't on what God was protecting them from. It was all the provision that was there. You can eat of any tree. There's just this thing and it protecting, you, protecting you from, and the, the temptation comes in the form of taking your eyes off all the things that God has for you, the wide open life of grace and liberty that God has in store for you when we follow Jesus, take our eyes off of all that good stuff and put our eyes on the small limitations that God puts, might put in front of us, the no's that are actually for our own good. I want to say this. My first point today is when we fully submit to his word, we are kept from trying to run our own lives independently from him. When we fully submit to his word. I wonder today, are you seeking to obey God and to live fully according to the Bible? So we get what it says in James 4 where it says, resist the devil. We like that. We like that. We like, yeah, I can do that. I'm going to stop doing the bad things. But the answer is not to stop first stop doing the bad things before that in the verse it says we need to submit to God submit to God and then resist the devil so when we submit to God we come under his leadership we come under all the things that he has planned for us which are good his plans I know your thoughts your plans for me are good if I was more organized we would have sung that song I'd just get the band up behind me now come on let's sing and uh, we're sort of in the spirit of that today, just singing and singing. I love it. And uh, so we need to submit to God and we need to submit to his word. Dallas Willard, thanks Declan, says this about submission. Submission is doing what another thinks is best. It is humbly setting aside our own ideas as supreme and our own will as ultimate. It applies the cross to our own lives. I love this. Freeing us of the burden of having our own way. Isn't that good? Freeing us of the burden of doing what we think is right. And that's exactly what God's heart was for Adam and Eve. Freeing them from that burden of trying to be God, of being God. We need to submit to God and we also need to submit to His, His Word. I wonder what areas of Scripture or what areas of life do we need to fully come under what the Word of God says and stop trying to twist it and make it more acceptable to what we really think it should be? Is it in the continual purchasing of items that we really don't need? Did you know we live in a materialistic society? Did you know that? More than any other time in the, in the history of the world, we are so materialistic. Things we don't need. Matthew 6, 20 says this in regards to that. Instead of all that, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Have we heeded that? Do we submit to that and the goodness within that? Or maybe connected to that, it's around generosity and financial giving. Later on in Matthew 6, it says this. No one can serve two masters. For you will hate one and love the other, you will be devoted to one and despise the other. 
You cannot serve God and let money master you. Have you fully submitted to that truth and command around God's teaching of money? It's not, often we think we come under, we treat scripture like the divine suggestions. The divine suggestions that we can sort of like, yes, this is a broad, a, a sort of a, a, a wide guide. I'll take, I'll take the kind of general principle, okay, don't, don't be too unwise with money, but money's kind of good. And, you know, obviously there's wisdom with that, but we can, we can easily twist it and into being what we want it to be rather than what it actually says. What about lust? Ugh. A friend of mine, a friend of mine said this. Uh, an old friend of mine, not one from the church, of course. Um, he said, he he said, you know, you can you can look, but you don't touch. You know, you can go window shopping, but it doesn't mean you have to buy. In terms of what, um, that's obviously hit a nerve because everyone's very quiet. <laughs> but but it's like, it's not. Hey, it's not just. Looking, looking can be troublesome. Lingering in your thought life can be troublesome. That principle is not true. In 1 Corinthians, says, it doesn't say linger around these things or stay focused on these things. It says flee, run away from it, get away from there. Ephesians 5.3 says not even, not even a hint. Don't even entertain it, this kind of thing in your life and you can see how sometimes we can we can find the wiggle room or forget to actually fully submit to God's commands and God's truths and actually let it fully guide us and not equivocate from what God has said you know my kids the other day um, we're teaching them to do all the stuff you know brushing your teeth um, holding hands, holding mum and dad's hand as you're crossing the road, wearing, making sure your helmet is on when you're riding the bike on the road or whatever. And you just always, we've been in a, Ari has just been in a series of, of the why, you know the why parents? The why. Why? Uh, hey love, go and brush your teeth. Why? Why? I'm like, because if you don't, your teeth are going to get rotten and you'll look ridiculous. <laughs> We should probably say something better than that, but kind of, you know. <laughs> like, hey, honey, hold, hold her hand. Don't let go of her hand until we're crossing the road. And she actually says, like, why? Why? There's no cars coming. And here's the thing. You know, so often, so often we, we do that with God is that we, we ask the why. And when we ask the why of what the Bible says, or maybe we don't fully understand why the Bible says what it says, in its ethics regarding sexuality and marriage, or its ethics around all the teachings around forgiveness and relationships, or you know, put in whatever you want in that space around what the Bible teaches and what the Bible says, and we can, we can, we don't fully understand it, and we can start to question it. Why? Or maybe, maybe that isn't really what God wants for me. And we can we can put in the, a small amount of truth that is like God's love. God's love becomes the only truth that we focus on. We're like, oh, if God, God loves me and so that God wants what's good for me. And so we can filter everything through that and forget that God is also just, that God hates sin, that there are things that God actually wants to put in place so that we can live fully as a reflection of him in the world and who he is, not just as love, but holy, blameless and pure, justice. And I love it now when we've sort of moved through a lot of the whys and now a lot of the time with Aria, not all the time, mind you, is that when we ask you to do something, she'll just, the, my favourite words are just like, okay, Dad. Sometimes, sometimes it's the best. I don't know why she says it, but she says, she was there, okay, Father. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Father. And I just like, it sounds really weird, but I just love it. It just, it just makes me so excited. I'm like, yeah, this is submission. She's responding to my leadership in her life. But I love that. I love that. And we need to get to that place with our Heavenly Father, which instead of always questioning why and looking for an easier option or a better option that would suit us, is to actually just lay down our obedience and say, because, not just because the Bible told me so, but because I trust the God behind the Word, 
because I know that His plans for me are good. I know that He's not just wanting to restrict my life. He's wanting a life of liberty and of fullness and that every tree is available to me. And so because I know that in my life, I've experienced His goodness and His grace and that He wants my, my best is that I'm going to lay down my obedience. And so no more am I going to say why and look for that side option. I'm just going to say, okay, Father. Okay, Father. I I will do what your word says. That's going to be the authority in my life. That's going to be my guiding force. Okay, Father. So we need to know God's character behind his commands. Because who knows that a lot of people can know the information of the Bible, but they can't actually know, they don't actually know God. They don't know his heart. My next point is this: we need to remember God's heart. That God has revealed himself most clearly through being a good father. God has revealed himself also most clearly through the good shepherd. A good father and a good shepherd. Think about those two things. Think of a good father provides, but he also protects. Isn't that what a good dad does? Offers protection, but also provision. Both good things. A shepherd leads and guides. You know, Psalm 23, which I just love. He leads me beside still waters. Guides us into places where we ultimately flourish and are fed. That God, a shepherd provides for the sheep. But a shepherd also protects. When I walk through the valley, his rod and his staff, they comfort me. Which are, which are tools of protection for a shepherd. And so the, God wants to provide, but he also wants to protect. And so when we get, when we remember his heart, when we remember both of those things at the same time, the provision, but also the protection, then we can fully submit to his word and the authority of the word and the commands as well as the promises in scripture. We're going to jump into a bit, as we know in John 10, 10, Jesus makes a divine a statement about his divinity that he says, I am the good shepherd. I want to spend a little bit of time just on this passage of scripture in John 10. Is, is that all right? And so um, have we got the start from verse 3? Declan, I don't know if I gave you that one or not. From verse 3. Awesome. Uh, now leave that one off for now. If we don't have verse 3, that's okay. I can, uh, I can remember it almost. Um, so, so what Jesus de- does, he says that a shepherd calls the sheep by, vo- by their voice. He calls them by name. <laughs> Even better, I was struggling. <laughs> <laughs> the, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. How about that? He calls his own sheep by name. And, and this is not just something that sounds pretty, but shepherds would, would sort of use the the individual, uh, individual markings or characteristics of the sheep and actually call them by that name. So he would, the shepherd would kind of know them individually amongst the flock. He calls the sheep by name and he leads them out. When he has brought all his sheep out, he goes ahead of them. I love that. And so what's happening here and why he's saying he goes ahead of them is because Jesus is contrasting his leadership and the gospel that he offers against the gospel that was offered by the religious leaders at the time, who wouldn't lead from the front. They would place these religious demands on the people, which were crippling and weighty. And it was all about a stringent adherence to rule keeping. And Jesus is coming in. He's criticizing that that leadership over their life, that voice over their life, that voice of leadership. And in Ezekiel 34, I don't have it on the screen, but there's this amazing passage in the Old Testament where where God condemns the religious leaderships as being false shepherds, as being violent and destructive towards the people. And then he offers this amazing promise and he says, I myself are going to be the shepherd for my people. It's beautiful. And he says, I'm going to be the shepherd. I'm going to gather my flock. I'm going to lead them. And so the readers at the time can make, will make the connection with, that, with the condemnation that, that God is having over the shepherding of the, of the people, the leadership over the people, but also the contrast 
of leadership that Jesus offers. He says, I'm not going to stand behind and order you around. I'm going to lead from the front. They'll never follow a stranger. In fact, in fact they'll run away from him because they don't re- recognize a stranger's voice. Talking about the religious leaders and that Jesus is the true shepherd. And then in that next one from verse 7, thanks Declan, it says, Therefore Jesus said again, Very truly I said, I'll tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me shall be saved. And I love that, the kind of leadership that Jesus offers. What he offers to us, that they will come in and go out and find pasture. Isn't that beautiful? The provision that Jesus offers, the kind of gospel that we have in Jesus but in contrast, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. I love that. The religious leaders at the time, their leadership was about keeping the rules. But Jesus was saying to find life and to find flourishing, it's not about keeping rules, it's about keeping close to Jesus, keeping close to the shepherd. Knowing his voice, that they will know my voice, I know them, and they will follow me, it says later in John. Wow, it's so good. Hey, do you know his voice? Do you know his voice? Does Jesus know you? I mean, of course he does, he knows everything, but you know what I mean. What about that relationship? What relationship do you have with the shepherd? It's not about keeping the rules. It's about keeping in close step with the shepherd and following him. He doesn't just want to restrict us and protect us from everything. He wants to provide for us and lead us into eternal life. I love what it says in Matthew 11. It has to be one of my favorite scriptures in the entirety of um, the Bible. Matthew 11, 28 and 30. Are you tired, worn out, burnt out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you will recover your life. I will show you how to take real rest. Walk with me and work with me and watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy. See his character, see his heart. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. You see that this is the true God in the Garden of Eden. This is his heart for us as people. This is the heart behind the commands and his leadership over our life. God's heart is to protect and provide. I wonder, are you listening to him? Have you fully come under the word? Are you wanting to be, stay close to the shepherd and be led by him into green pastures and to full life? Hey, we're about to watch a clip uh, in a moment that illustrates this illustrates how um, a shepherd... So here's the thing, right? That um, Just a bit of context, what Jesus is talking about. The, the sheepfold is that they would often... Shepherds would often bring their um, flocks into the one place, into a large pen. And so there would be multiple flocks within the one place. And the shepherds would go and have a sleep and there'd be some hired um, gatekeepers that would sort of just keep watch, stay in the gate. And so in the morning... In the morning, the shepherds would come and would call the sheep. And, and the sheep, having spent time with... Having, the, sh- the sheep, having spent time under the sh- shepherd's leadership, would respond to his voice and would be led out by him. They know the shepherd's voice. And we've got a clip that illustrates, that shows a shepherd um, who calls, is calling his sheep. Thanks, Declan. What a, what a picture of the sheep that have spent time with the shepherd, that know his voice, that have submitted to his way, have laid down their obedience in, in knowing that that's where the food is, that's where the life is, that's where the protection is, that's where the real way is. I want to invite the band to come as we close. I, and I wonder today, how, do you know the voice of the good shepherd? Do you 
Have you spent time with him? Is it your desire? Is it it the deepest desire of your heart to know him? To love him? To keep relationship with him? John 10, 27 says this. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. As we conclude our Who Are You Listening To series, the question in all these influences, all these voices is, are you listening? Are you listening to God? Are you letting Him lead you? Are you looking to your, yourself for leadership or are you allowing His leadership to lead you into fullness of life? Not necessarily an easy life, but the fullness of life. Are you listening to his voice? Do you have a posture, just like Samuel had in the temple, when when God called again the third time, Eli had wisely said, go and respond to the Lord. And Samuel said this, he said, God said, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I'm listening. You have authority in my life. I will do what you call me to do. I will lead me where you want me to go. And he did. And it led to a nation being saved. Are you submitting to the truth and the authority of the Bible to guide you into who you are called to be? Or are you allowing your decision, your decisions to be shaped by your ideas and your own will for self? Are you walking with Jesus and allowing him to lead you? When we're considering leadership, it means leaving some things behind. It means not being led by other things, including ourselves. It means submitting to him. But C.S. Lewis said this, he said, whatever we give up, there are far, far greater things ahead. When we say yes to Jesus, there are far greater things ahead. What we say yes to is far greater than what we say no to. Why don't we stand together as we respond to this message of the Good Shepherd He's calling us out. Calling us by name. Calling us to come to Him. Calling us to leave the other flocks that are next to you. And this morning, I want to give an opportunity. If, if you've come here today and, and you honestly say, I, I just, I need to give my life afresh to Jesus. Maybe for the first time, you've come to that point where God's got your heart. You want to lay down yourself and say yes to Him and respond to all that He's done for you. You know it's your time. Friends, Jesus is our good shepherd. He laid His life down so that we, so that you may have life. And there is no sheep, there is no person who is so lost that he can't find you, that he doesn't know you, that he can't restore you. And it's only through faith in him that we can find true and eternal life. And for those today, if you're saying, this is me, that's me, I want to do that. I want to give my life to Him that when you do that and when you turn from your old life, your old leadership of yourself and you give your life to Him, there is a party that goes on in heaven for you will come from death to life. You've been found and you're no longer lost. You can receive His love, forgiveness and new life and His peace today. And if that's you, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond in a moment. But maybe it's not for the first time and you're just sitting there and thinking, man, I've 
I believe in God. I've given my life to Him in the past, but today is my day where I want to rededicate afresh and submit my life to Him, to the Good Shepherd, to lead me, to submit to His Word. Wherever you call me, I'll go. Whatever you say, I'll do. For my life is not my own. I belong to you. And if you want to give your life to Him afresh today, I would encourage you to do that and to raise your hand along with everybody else. So if that's you today with, with everyone just here, no closing your eyes, but if that's you today, I just invite you to raise your hand to say, I give my life afresh to you, Lord. You are my good shepherd. I will follow you. I submit my life to you, my will, my heart, my decision making. I'm no longer my own. If that's you, just raise your hand and keep it up as a declaration of His Lordship and Kingship over your life. Awesome. So good. Keeping your hands raised, I want to invite those who've got your hands up and also for the rest of us, let's just renew our heart and our devotion to God today, to draw close to Jesus and to be led by Him. Let's all do that today. And let's pray this out loud together. Loving God. Come on, let's pray together. Loving God. Thank You that You're our Good Shepherd. Thank You for leading us and guiding us. Protecting and providing. Today I give my life afresh to you. Forgive me for wanting my own way. You are my Lord, my leader and my guide. Fill me afresh with your Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for loving and saving me. Amen, amen. Let's sing this together.